you guys are going to start turning in weekly reading assignments because of the craziness with Katrina and all the, the press and everything. I've been slow to, to get this up to speed for you guys, but um, your first one will be due this week. You can turn it in late. You can even turn it in next week. It's fine. Uh, but starting next week, um, we'll have weekly readings that are due. And so I want to just go over what I'm expecting, uh, excuse me, weekly reading summaries, I should have said, that are due. And this isn't meant to be a big burden. It's meant to get you guys to get in the flow of reviewing and, and critiquing scientific papers. So I just want to talk about what I'm going to expect of you guys. Now, uh, we'll talk about uh, what's eligible, but the short version is it's all the, the e-reserve papers. It's all the stuff that is not inside the books that I'm, uh, book chapters or what have you. So a lot of the stuff we have, for example, William Languishi's book is um, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, read this chapter, read that chapter. It's great. It's really useful. I think it'll really deepen your understanding of a lot of these coastal and marine management issues. But they're not necessarily a standalone paper or study or something of that nature. So, what's that? <laughs> nice. So, um, so these are these are all possible things that we would consider scientific papers, technical papers. Primarily, what will be in the e-reserves will mostly be the stuff that's in white. And generally speaking, um, the, the quality, on average, not, not by any means every single case, but generally speaking, the quality is going to be the highest at the research paper and decrease as we go down. That doesn't mean it's bad by any means, but in theory, the research paper should have the highest scrutiny brought to it. So it should have the most intense review by folks other than the authors. Again, not to say that something it is, isn't as fully reviewed isn't just completely awesome and totally fantastic, but, but that's, that's what we're talking about. So mostly we're talking about research paper, review papers, all this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm sure this is a review for most of you guys. But the research paper is something, right, where, uh, for example, if you guys are in Capstone right now, or if you've worked with me on other projects and we're writing stuff up, this is where independent scientists have gone out and they've examined a hypothesis They've, they've collected some data and they've tested that hypothesis and they've published it in a peer-reviewed journal. We usually call those research papers. The next thing would be the same idea, but I didn't collect all the data myself. Maybe instead um, we did a seminar and that's something, you know, if you guys are interested, we could do this, I don't know, next semester. If you guys had something really, really of interest to you, get a bunch of students together. Everybody goes out and finds 20 papers about topic whatever and we come together. Uh, or, about, or about the topic, you know, every single thing ever written on redfish or something like that. We'd pull it all together and we would write a paper on these other papers. Sometimes this is called a meta-analysis in, in some of the popular language now. But the idea is basically, what's the state of the knowledge of this theory, of this system, of this organism, what have you. And so those are very helpful as well, even though they're not necessarily um, inclusive of any original research. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, and so, and so, you know, it would be, what's the state of drug resistance or something like that, and so, and, and these are, these are, you know, it's easy, so the research paper, we're sort of down in the weeds, to generally speaking, right, we're like, what's everything about this, this one turtle in this one bay, and how does this one turtle in this one bay respond to, I don't know, noise from a motorboat kind of thing. Whereas the review paper is looking at all the turtles and all the, or, or sound in, you know, sub-sea areas, how that affects all herps kind of thing. Um, so both very useful. Letters is something that is, in, um, it's very interesting. Well, it'll be interesting to see if we have letters, correspondence letters in the next 50 years. Letters were invented back in the day when, <laughs> at the same time, they were invented the same time as the gowns that we wear at graduation, that we all sweat crazily in the crazy, crazy hot sun in late spring in Southern California, right? That was all created in medieval Europe, right? And the idea was this was back when we went to, to university in a castle and it was crazy cold, right? So that, those robes were literally to keep warm, right? That was where that tradition came from. Similarly, at the same time, we didn't have internet or, or even a Pony Express or anything of that nature, right? So the idea was if we found in a, in a book or a, or a um, journal that someone found some new um, 
uh, you know, came to some new understanding about that turtle in that bay, let's say, how the heck will we find out about it? Well, we might write to the person, and you and I might, and we might start a letter correspondence, but what if it was more of a conceptual thing? And I didn't really know you, and I didn't necessarily want to work on turtles, maybe, but, you know, this really seems messed up to me, and I study sound, and I think this turtle biologist didn't understand the sound. So I would write a letter to the journal itself, and uh, in the next several months, there would be uh, what's called the correspondence published. And so, so that would be treated um, like a peer review thing. So I write a letter, but they don't just publish my letter. It's not like, uh, it's not like something on Facebook. It is, the letter itself is scrutinized. Not to the same degree as the research paper, but uh, and letters are much shorter. You know, typically a few paragraphs. There might be some new data in there. You might say, like, look, here's my data. Look, at this shows the opposite thing. Or, Oftentimes it might take that person's da the, the data from the research paper and do a reanalysis of it and say, oh, actually, that doesn't show that. It actually shows this. And then, and then um, uh, someone might, th then the, the, so in other words, the author says, X is happening. And I write a thing, a letter saying, oh, that's cool. I actually think Y is actually happening. And here's why I think Y is happening. So I think you got this part of the paper wrong then the authors have an opportunity to write back and say, actually, you're totally wrong. We knew that. We knew it was a possibility, but we found it wasn't. The, right? And so sometimes these letters, these letter correspondence chains can go on for a long time. And they're actually very, very, they can be very, very illuminating. It's usually not petty stuff. It's usually not, well, you're, in a, you're a jerk. You know, it's usually not that kind of stuff. And so, the, and so reading these things can be really, really helpful, especially if we're not an expert in the field, right? Because it can really illuminate Oh, I never thought about that, right? Because just like the stuff that you guys submit, just like the stuff I submit, we never have all the space we possibly could want, right? We always have to be, you know, cutting out some things or whatever. And sometimes some of those things are really important. We have to make a judgment call. Should we cut this out or that out? We cut this out. And then these letters are oftentimes an exploration of that stuff that we um, have left out. So um, uh, there's an example of this uh, when we, when we get to um, papers, uh, one of the papers we wrote on the Deepwater Horizon, the, um, the American Petroleum Institute disagreed with one of our conclusions. So they wrote a letter, and then I wrote a letter back. And so, so you guys, if you haven't seen one of these, you can, you'll see it uh, you know, this week or next week when you read that stuff. Um, so yeah, okay, that's letters. And then chapters would just be, um, so to be clear, we have books which are written by a person or a, or a handful of people. Then we, have then we have what are called edited books. And so the edited books, the person on the front cover's name are, is the person or the persons that um, did, the, did the pulling together. And they usually write a chapter or two, but there's actually many, many authors. So it's almost like a journal, right? And so chap an edited book also undergoes peer review. Okay, so each of those things, each of those chapters is being reviewed by both the editor of the book and quite possibly other people as well. Then we get to a regular old book, which is just, you know, maybe you're super passionate about whatever, solar energy in Southern California, you write a book on solar energy. And then as we go down, the, the default rigor of the review of the piece of technical writing goes down. And so, so an invited paper to conference, uh, a poster at a conference, and then what we call gray literature. A huge amount of the stuff we deal with in management is gray literature, right? Because we're not so much interested in necessarily the exact temperature at which a sea turtle goes from male to female, right? Which might be more the subject for a research paper. We tend to be more worried about, hey, what does a power plant one mile away from a turtle nest do to the temperature in the sand? And that type of stuff tends to be more in consultant reports and reports from federal agencies, that kind of stuff. And so, so we would call that uh, gray literature, te technically speaking. Uh, and then the, the final thing that I would put under the, the rubric of scientific papers would be um, a technical web page. And this is increasingly um, important an important source of information for us. So this would be maybe a climatological service is putting their data up on the web. This could be um, a uh, herbarium. 
at an herbar yeah, an herbarium at a university that's now scanned in all their all their records. And so we could go there and we could say, ah, did did plant X exist in this county or did it not? That kind of stuff. So those are all those are all what we might call um, scientific papers. So again, you're mostly going to be focusing on the the white ones in our class um, in, in terms of what you can focus on for your summary, reading summary. As a reminder, again, this is probably all refresher for you guys, but as a reminder, we're talking about written communication. And this is distinct from, ha from the videos you guys watch or from hearing me speak or whatever. It, it's, it's obvious, but it's important to reiterate that you don't have any of the change of voice or me waving my hands to emphasize things, right? So, so it's all static. And because of that, it, it can be easy to take the wrong way. It can be easily taken out of context. It can be easily misunderstood if you don't fully know the language or fully know the discipline. On the upside, though, it allows a high level of detail, our highest level of detail, just, just about, right? More so than what I can just dump, dump on you in a lecture, more so than what you can get on a YouTube video. Um, it, it really is uh, high density data, potentially, uh, per, per unit space of area we're talking about. The great thing is that it is potentially infinite, right? We can read Darwin's paper, right? Some of the papers that Darwin wrote about whatever, plant growth or coral reef formation right now, right? So that's pretty cool. And it doesn't guarantee that if you write a paper 300 years from now, somebody's going to read it, but at least there's a potential that it exists for a long, long time. Uh, and so some of the papers you guys will be, will be reading in this class are old, right? But they're still relevant. To our, to our discussions or our learning. Um, as a default, it's by itself. Increasingly, as we publish these things online and things are hypertexted and things are linked to other things, um, this is maybe becoming not true, but at least traditionally, this paper needs to be read alone. A well-written technical piece of communication should be picked up by someone, now maybe not a history major that knows nothing about sand or something, but at least someone with a general basic understanding of environmental science, of coastal processes, of ecology, whatever the case may be, you should, uh, a well-written one is I should be able to pick this up and go with it, right? So it should take me along um, and, and, and give me whatever back, key essential background information I need to understand the issue in that paper. And so you will tell me whether these papers do that, <laughs> do that or don't. Um, and then lastly, they um, especially, especially the topmost ones here, follow a very clear format. The other difference in this list from top to bottom is not just the rigor, but also the format consistency. As we go down towards the bottom of the page, the format changes a lot, such that if we get to a technical web page, it might take several minutes to figure out what's going on, right? <clears throat> because we follow this traditional format, an introduction, the methods, the results, you can um, jump around, right? This was hypertext before we had hypertext. So you could, you could organize it as you see fit. So for example, I never, almost never, read a paper from start to finish, ever. I have, there's a video I can link to you guys if you, for more about this. But um, I will read the title, and then I'll read the abstract, and then I'll usually jump to something like the results. And then I'll jump to the methods probably next. And, you know, it depends. I jump around. But because stuff is organized, it allows you to do that. So it's not like, let's say, um, a history paper, which is all text or, 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 or could be all text with no section breaks or whatever. So that should be a help to you guys. And realize you have to consume the information, but it's up to you to come up with your most efficient way um, in terms of how you want to consume this information. Right, versus if we're talking about link, one of the chapters in one of our books, you pretty much got to start of the chapter and go to the, to the bottom, right? That, that's the only way to really read it. Okay, so let's talk about what, what you guys are going to submit for a reading summary. So this is an example reading summary here. A couple different things. Let me just point them out here. It's going to have your name. It's going to have the class. It's going to have the week uh, and the date. This is that it's due. So things are always due the Monday of that week. 
So sometimes we'll be on, let's say, the field trip or whatever, and, and I'll say, you guys can submit this next week, but, but please make sure you include the date it was due. Um, it makes it much easier for me to figure out what you're, what you're doing in writing. Okay, next it'll have the title of the paper there, okay, and the author. Next, separate it, so separate from the, tech, from the title, excuse me, and separate from this following text, it has this bolded uh, one sentence. Ideally, that bolded one sentence is going to be a hypothesis statement. So, so what is the, the, the central hypothesis these guys are trying to test? In some cases, the, the paper might not be that type of a paper, in which case you should do a summary sentence, an overview, like what's the, the one nut, the one kernel of, of key uh, concept they're trying to get across. Okay, then hit a carriage return, have a space. And so now we're gon going to get into the meat of the paper and there's basically, Basically, two paragraphs are cool. If you want to do a third or whatever, that's fine. But basically, two paragraphs is all I'm looking for. First one is a summary of what factually happened in the paper. So they did this study. They measured fish here. You know, da, 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 that kind of thing. They found X. They found Y. Okay. The, then the, the next paragraph is, or the second half, is going to be um, you're thinking about this. Okay. So was this interesting? Was this boring? What does this imply? Uh, this is this is totally different from what we read last week, or this is con, you know contradictory to what we read last week. I wonder how they fit together, like that kind of stuff, right? Then at the very end, uh, you know, space a carriage return, and then uh, two or three bullet points. Don't have, they don't do not have to be complete sentences here. It can just be a, you know a phrase, short phrase is fine. But that's going to be what is um, at least two things that were good. Of, every single paper has something that's that, that's good about it. Right? The graphs were really clear. Uh, the, the introduction was a really well done introduction, you know, something like that. And then two or three bullet points about what was not good. Very confusing methodology, did not explain their statistics, you know, whatever, whatever the, the case may be. And so this, this is, you know, the first one or two might take you a little bit. It shouldn't take a long, it shouldn't, shouldn't take a lot amount of time, right? You've, you've read the paper and you're gonna, you know, bang this guy out. Again, or wait, I didn't say this, one reading summary per week. Even if we have five papers in the thing, or two papers in the thing, or whatever, it's, it's, and you guys pick the one that you found most interesting. So you, you just have to write one on the one that you found the most compelling, or the one that made you the most angry, or whatever the case may be. So just one per week. Um, yeah. And so this, this example on the right is an example of a great sum, sum, summary. Again, just to re reiterate, it's got a one sentence hypothesis. It's got the highlights of the paper. It's got the inspiration that you took away from the paper. And then it's got a few good and a few bad bullet points. Does that make sense? Is that cool? Any questions about that? Are we going to turn this in online or free uh, Physically turn it. Yeah, so we might, uh, we're so small, we might try something different. But the default is you guys physically print it up and turn it in. Okay, I just want to show you um, some examples of maybe things that aren't as good. So an example of an okay thing that's not really that great would be, you know, did parts of this stuff, but not everything. So in this case, here's one where the person didn't um, uh, provide a, a distinct hypothesis overview statement. They didn't put the title separate. They didn't follow the formatting rules, right? Um, but they did include the highlights of the paper. They did include at least a little bit of personal inspiration, uh, but they didn't do any bullet points. They, they didn't, you know, highlight anything. So this is this is not horrible, but it's not, um, you know, what I want to see. <clears throat> and then here's an example of one that's pretty poor. So uh, this one, in and I only circled a few, a few things. There there were lots of issues here, but um, so there's a lot of grammatical errors, spelling errors, stuff like that. Um, they did have a, uh, the title and everything, that's great. They did have the um, central hypothesis that was trying to be tested, so that's good. Um, but they didn't really spend much time summarizing it and it was pretty sloppy. They didn't really t talk about their interpretations. They, um, they did give some bullets, but generally this is too short and too, too perfunctory. Here's another one that's even worse. So, you know, stuff is 
slide, and, and, and you should use this as an opportunity to, to practice your writing, right? So this is a chance, this is every week, no matter what, you guys are doing at least a little bit of writing for us. And um, bang it out before you turn it in. I mean, I, I, I'm, I've gotten horrible. I've gotten just like some of you guys. Uh, and that I write an email, and then if I just hit send, oh my God, is it the most embarrassing thing in the world? It's like, geez, that, that, that was a different word. I had that get in there. Either it got autocorrected or I was just stupid. And then like this thing is misspelled and there's an at instead of an and, the spell check didn't get that. And you know, so, so pause, before you submit anything, go back and have a reread. I have to do that too, right? We all have to do it. It's so easy to type and stuff now. Um, take a break, go take a sip of water, go take a shower, go sleep, whatever, next morning get up and just reread through it. And can I, you know, is this all good? Is this, is this written well? And can I maybe tighten this up a little bit? So in this case, this person had a lot of tightening up that they could have uh, done, if they'd and especially if they'd followed the format. Um, another thing that is increasingly, um, I think, because ESRM is we're we you know we're we're a small program and we do a lot of stuff together, and you guys are out at the beach with me, and you're in the lab. Sometimes we get a little little informal, maybe a little too informal, and so what I've noticed in the last year or two is people have started turning in stuff like this, right? Oh, sorry, sorry, you know, it, my, the printer was messed up, so here you go. No, doesn't work, right? Doesn't count. Everything you guys do, everything you submit, needs to be professional, right? And so you guys are about, almost all of you are about to graduate, right? We're going to the, the real world here. Um, unacceptable for you to turn in a, a job, a report to your boss, or whatever, so this, this is also unacceptable. So um, everything needs to be good, not just the writing, the grammar, but also the, the overall thing. If I can't read it, it doesn't count, right? So you guys get it. But then realize what I found is some of this is a little different formatting from your traditional thing. Sometimes you guys have problems figuring out how to do a bullet. Sometimes you have problems figuring out stuff. So in this case, this person was trying to type um, um, you know, the null hypothesis. And so it, properly written, it's, it's HYP, and then there's a subscript not zero, you know, zero and they just didn't, they didn't know how to do it. And so that's totally, so I want you to do it the right way. So if you guys have anything, if you guys have any questions, we're going throughout the semester. It might be a graphing thing. It might be a, might be a, a paper, you know, working in Word thing or an Excel thing, whatever it is, ask me. Hey, I can't figure out how to make the thing go high. I can't figure out how to make the thing be bolded, whatever. It's all good, Let, let's figure it out, right? So, so send me a, a question and, and let's figure that out. Again, everything has to be professional. Um, and then, yeah, and then just to wrap this up, I'll say that uh, I was an undergrad too, a long time ago maybe, but I was an undergrad too, and I understand that, oh my God, I forgot to do this, better do it, and I understand, oh, it doesn't look very good, I should probably screw with my margins, and maybe I'll triple space it, and whatever, so it's, it's pretty obvious, right, so this, this one here is a, is a great amount of effort, right, good, good summary, single spaced, da, 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 da. Uh, over here, it's like, you know, so they squeezed in the margins as much as they, you know, they, they just, you know, it's obvious, right? So, so I, I'm not stupid, is what I'm trying to say, right? So, so do a good job and we're all good. Okay, that was a little bit about our reading summary things. Everybody good? Everybody, any questions? Okay, good. All right, so the next one thing that we're going to be focusing a lot in this class on is quantitative data. Um, quantitative data is generally. Interpreting it, you guys creating it, communicating it, etc. So I want to do a little exercise here on, um, on that. So here we go. So here, here, here's a bar graph. So we're, I want you guys to tell me what's going on with this bar graph. West Coast is bigger, right. Something. We don't know what. Something. Mascots, okay. So we got that. So something about a, some kind of mascot something. The costumes they wear. Okay, maybe the costumes that these mascots are wearing. Okay, cool. <laughs> the, yeah, it could be. It could be our uh, Echo. Echo might be really fat compared to some spelt <laughs> East Coast universities or something. Possibly. Okay, good. Okay, good. So Aspen's talking about the error. Okay, so, so some, there's something about the, these bars, right? Okay. The numbers for the scale are awful. 
Right. Okay. Okay. Good. So, so there's something about volumes. There's something about mascots. There's something about geographic areas imply that things are different. But now let's pick up what you guys are talking about. So, so what are some of the issues that are problematic? So we got we got the we got this guy is all crazy dense and, and hard to read. No units. No units. So no label on the axis as to what as to what the thing is being measured and no specific m metric of what the unit that was being measured was. Good. Colors are, colors are bad, uh, and what'd you say? No title. No title, okay, right, good. So don't, so no um, y-axis, no title. Also just the description, so mascot costume values, or volumes, that doesn't really tell us anything. Right, right, right. So, so maybe that would be a fine introductory title if there was additional information provided but in and of itself, it's, you know, is this, is this the West Coast of Europe, of Asia, of, of Australia? I mean, you know, what? Good. Okay, so what else? South America? Okay, well, good. Well, the central part of, if we're talking about America, is a whole lot bigger than West Coast, East Coast, so it might be a little... There you go. Exactly. So, so, so we don't know how to properly interpret this, right? If we don't fully know all the... the underlying facts and units and things, it's very difficult to interpret it. So, so Aspen talked about the error bars, and those clearly are what those are, but what are they? Are they max and min? Are they standard deviation? Are they 95% confidence intervals? What are they? So, so they're, they're most likely some, some estimate of the spread of the data, right? So I was trying to tell us something about how all the West Coast things, whatever they were, were distributed, and something about how all the East Coast things were distributed, which we might be able to try to compare to see if they're significantly different from one another or not. But not knowing what those things are, we can't, we don't, we, we can't really, even a, a qualitative graphical interpretation, we can't, we can't do that. Um, good. Other, thing, other things you guys saw? Okay, so here's an attempt to make this a little bit better. Okay, just a little bit with, with, with minimal effort. So what do we do? We, um, so one, we added uh, a label on the x-axis for whatever. So, uh, so this says conference. We're talking about conferences here, which might not be actually on the West Coast or whatever, but they're in, in this group called West Coast. We added a descriptor on the y-axis that says costume volumes, and it, we're saying it's cubic meters. So that tells us, gives us some kind of sense of what's going on. Staying on that y-axis, the units have been um, not changed, but they've been clarified, right? And they're not overloading each other. So we can now glance at this and get a much, much uh, better sense as to um, uh, what the values are. Um, we've labeled what the error bars are. So the top of the bar is going to be the, is the mean. And then the bar on top is a positive uh, standard deviation. So we got that. We also had the comment about the color, right? So here we had three different colors, which, okay, cool. But did, you know, maybe that played into something else in our poster or our presentation. So that would maybe make sense to carry it over into this figure. But just giving us a single figure, that is not, doesn't help, right? It doesn't really signify anything. This, um, uh, is just as interpretable, if not more interpretable, than having the bars all multiple colored. And then, of course, we have the, the title. In this case, the title is on the bottom. So this would be, say, a figure from a, a research paper. This is figure one, volume of mascot, mascot costumes of all minor league baseball teams, a total of 42, in the United States in 1999, right? Now we can, OK, got it. So it's not Echo, right? It is. Uh, I don't know, I can't think of a, can't think of a, there you go, there you go, there you go. So, um, yeah, so there we go. So, so the first step is getting the data together. What does it mean? What does it look like? Let's pull it together, let's see what the big pattern is. But that is not enough, particularly, particularly in a, in a setting like coastal marine management. We always have to think about how folks are going to interpret it. So our first, our first audience is always our technical expert colleagues when we're, when we're doing anything like this. Great. But we have an additional bar. 
and ESRM generally in coastal management in particular, that we want this data to be used, generally speaking, right? We want people to take it and, and, and have it be applicable to their current or future management issue. And so we want to make sure this is easily interpretable to everybody, right? That can't, every once in a while that doesn't quite work. But 99% of the time, making a graph easily readable to the public is also going to make it more easily readable to our technical audience. So back in the day, when PowerPoint started coming up, this is how old I am. We, I started before we had PowerPoint. I know it's, it's ancient. But um, uh, we, I had some of my friends were like, oh, I'm not going to do that. It was, I mean, everybody went to PowerPoint. But they said, I'm not going to do that like colored thing. And I mean, that's like, that's, that's all distracting, man. Like, I just need to black and white graphs. I'm always just going to do black and white graphs, black and white graphs, because that's, that's the purest thing for scientists, some of my friends said, right? They're not trying to trick you with, like, colors and, like, nice fonts and stuff, right? As if that was somehow uh, sugarcoating crappy data, right? Uh, and indeed, people, have tr people try to do that sometimes. But, but I would argue that a well-put-together graph uh, is helpful to both technical experts and the people that have less uh, technical training, right? So, so we should always be striving for clear communication. So when you guys are reading one of these papers, it's totally fair. One of your comments is to say, hey, this data is presented very poorly. I can't, it, it doesn't make sense. Was it X or was it Y? I can't tell. So that's a fair criticism of any of the reading studies you, you might do. Okay, and then we'll do one more here. So here we go. Uh, this is a quote from the Wall Street Journal, and this is from uh, a couple years ago. And I'll just read the, the quote. The quote says, President Obama asked the wealthiest Americans to pay a little more, quote unquote, the math, and this is in the context of tax policy, uh, the mathematical reality is that Washington will need to soak the middle class because that's where the big money is. And they provided this graph. Okay, so this is in a major national newspaper. And here's that figure. Okay, so what they're saying is, um, look, uh, all the money is coming from, what they, what the hell they call it? Uh, the middle class. All the money is coming from soaking the middle class. And then they accompany this. And if you glance at that, you go, oh my God, yeah, look, this is where the money's coming from. And look, they're going to soak the middle class. So, any, 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 any comments on that figure? Yeah. There might be more people making $75,000, but all the money is still the people making more than $10 million at the end of the graph. Okay. Let's talk specifically about the graph. Notice anything? about that? The axes are what? Okay, so well, this guy's label. So this is this is trillions of dollars. Uh, yeah, maybe not labeled as clearly, but it's, it's still this is obviously trillions of dollars. And this is this is income level. Anything else you guys see about that, though? Hard, hard to read, possibly. Okay. Although on the, if you're reading it on online, as I was here, if you click the enlarged image, you could make it about this size. So th there's something even more fundamental that you guys are, are. I mean, all the things you're saying are are okay, but but there's there's a big, huge, glaring issue with this graph. They're lumping more people on the edge. Yes. Than yes. Whenever you do a bar graph, the implication is that you have bins of equal size. That's what a bar graph is for. The bins on this x-axis have been intentionally changed to mislead you. Right? Let's have a look. Uh, this bin right here is people it, it, uh, covers a range of five million dollars. How many people are making, or, or excuse me, are are um, uh, yeah, have a, a declared tax income of between five and ten million dollars. This one right here is between one and five thousand dollars. So this bin represents people making a range of four thousand dollars. This is five million dollars, and this bin over here is more than ten million. Just and everybody else. So if we if we actually graphed the graph correctly, 
in something like this, in, in equal size bins, this is what you'd get. So it's what you guys were saying from qualitatively that, oh my God, no, most of the income is coming from the, from the farthest right end of that x-axis, right? So you need to be careful. And as we talk about things, so I use this example because it has nothing to do with coastal management, right? So we can, we can be, be separate from talking about any of our, our uh, topical issues here, and the same with the last one. Um, but realize there will be folks, because the arenas that we travel in are not just the technical expert worlds, there, we do get into stuff like op-eds, and people will quote op-eds at, at, at meetings. And they'll be, and somebody will have a blog, I got a blog, so look at my blog, right? That kind of stuff. And so increasingly, um, in our field, we have to deal with something like this. Someone coming up and go, well, what about that article in the blah, blah, blah? It could be awesome. It could be a fantastic piece of data. It could be great, even though it's not peer reviewed. But you need to bring a skeptical eye to this stuff. Not to be a jerk or not to be mean, but really? And I would, and I would suggest that, generally speaking, the more people come from a particular advocacy standpoint, the more you should make sure you're bringing a, a cautious eye because they have usually an agenda. In this case, these guys have an agenda where they don't want any taxes. They, they don't want to raise taxes. And so they've clearly, I wouldn't say lied, but are actively trying to mislead you into thinking that their statement, their arguments are valid. And so, uh, so yeah, so that, that's, that's the world that we live in. And so you guys will not do that. You guys will not produce a graph like this for, for me when it comes time to do that. Or maybe we, should, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should have an exercise where you guys just try to take this data and then lie as hard as you can with it. <laughs> and then like go, over, go to the student union and just show like five people, what do you think this is? This, think this isn't good? And see how many people buy it, right? But, but um, yeah, but uh, generally speaking, I don't want you to do that, right? I want you to do the, um, you know, a rigorous, uh, honest, objective presentation of the data. Okay, and then just, just la lastly, we're, we're getting more, doing more technical writing in this class. You guys are doing capstone, a lot of you, and that kind of stuff. This is a thing that I'll, I'll post up for you guys, but basically, um, uh, this is not tweeting, right? We're not tweeting, we're not pop popping off an email to a friend. This, is, this should be rigorous. Always try to make your writing as tight as possible as succinct as possible, as crisp as possible.